Good morning, everyone. I welcome our eminent spe speakers and colleagues on the dais, Mr. Matthew Lavis and Asima, who will be joining us in 10 minutes. Unfortunately, Mr. Hota had to travel last minute to Delhi, so he sent his regret. But he's al always graced our conference by his active participation. I also welcome uh, all the key people from government and RBI officers who are present here, all of you as a delegates, colleagues from the industry. So this is like ninth year that I'm addressing this conference and very happy to be part of it. It looks like yesterday. I'm sure many of you have been kind of an avid uh, supporter and must have been attending most of those events that we have done year on year. So last year when I was here on the same dais, though different venue, though the first conference happened in, a, in the same place where we are currently. So we were speaking about two key things last year. The reins at RBI had changed, new governor had just joined. I'm sure all of you are aware, Mr. Raghuram Rajan had just joined that time and we were, I was saying that it is first time that any governor has mentioned in his maiden speech, his first speech about payments, about non-bank entities, about focus on financial inclusion. And probably that was just the beginning. In the last 12 months, we have already seen so much of action in those areas by the RBI and the government. So to name a few of them, I'm sure many of you know, do you want to kind of quickly volunteer and say what those changes we have seen with RBI? Anyone? If you guys are still not sleepy from your research and exertion last, last night. Anyone? What changes in last 12 months RBI has announced? New concepts? No volunteers. People are still sleepy. I thought, sorry? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's very right. Payment bank, yeah. I, I actually was waiting for that word. I thought that would come in from everyone. Payment bank, which was a big concept. Yeah? BC relaxation for distance criteria, right? BBPS guidelines, which is aims at uh, making bill payments easier for consumer irrespective of any instrument they use, wherever they are from. So BBPS guidelines, simplified KYC, which is again recently announced by RBI so that more and more people can be inducted in formal financial system. So many action has happened, and payment and a small bank has been a special concept, which was not even part of the vision document, but that came in as a game changer, potentially game changer for many of us sitting here. So all these changes have come in last 12 months, and so much of action has started. And I believe some of these changes are likely to change the structure of our industry. Some of the players who are participating in a certain role will fundamentally shift and change in the next 12 months. Similarly, I think we saw another change at the central, which was in the government, right? In the last 12 months. And it only renewed the focus on financial inclusion with the recent Jandhan scheme that has been announced. I'm sure it's just the beginning. There's a lot more behind that which will come. And in particular, I would also like to mention efforts by the government on integrating KYC requirements across financial sectors. Probably many of us don't talk about it much, but that has huge impact or likely impact on the way we enroll customer, the way we acquire customer, with impact on the cost and efficiencies of the whole enrollment process. So if you see all these changes have happened in the last 12 months, some anticipated, some had come out of a positive surprise. So we at PCI, I would not get into too much of detail of PCI, but last 12 months at PCI have been also very busy. As a chair, I have to share some of the key updates, what all has happened at PCI. We were definitely integral part of all those policy changes that are coming in terms of dialogue within the industry players, with the regulators, and other stakeholders. So there has been continuous dialogues on variety of subjects, whether payment bank, BBPS guidelines, simplified KYC, existing PPI guidelines. In addition to that, there are, there are two years back, we were interested with the key task for the whole payment ecosystem, irrespective of whichever business model you were running as a BC or as a PPI or as a merchant aggregator. We were asked to look at seriously around SRO, self-regulatory organization within PCI, to manage the best practices and governance of all these entities within the industry. So as we speak, better late than never, as we say, the first SRO for PPI is about to go live. We have all the key members of the key committees already in place. The part of the final document is already ready. Only assessment template is now underway, which will be ready. Similarly, merchant aggregation and intermediary 
group, which is headed by Viswas, has also now started working on SRO. And this will be followed by other groups also. So we've been actively working on these SRO arrangements. We believe it is very important to mitigate any potential risk for our industry and pave a way for a smooth growth. Similarly, there has been additional work which was done by multiple groups that we have within the, P within the PCI. There has been efforts to create standardized user experience for all e-commerce transactions. There has been continuous talk about implication of two-factor authentication, positives, negatives, which scenario it works better, which scenario it doesn't work better. There has been specific challenges around net banking uh, processes and experiences with multiple bank. So Viswas has been leading some of those initiatives. Uh, in addition to this, we also inducted uh, PwC as our knowledge partner last year. And as we speak, I mentioned that the whole industry and the business models are likely to undergo a huge change. There was debate and a questions, which I'm sure you will discuss throughout two day sessions in different sessions that if payment bank comes in, what is the future of, P of OBCs and PPIs? So we at the industry body said, we definitely believe there is enough role for everyone. When you have a 97% physical cash transaction in our country, there is a role for everyone. The question is, are we focused and are we clear as an industry player that which is our play that we want to play? So still to facilitate it and help the whole industry players, we at PCI are now working with PwC to create a framework which is tiered around three types of a, of a, you could say, business models and the risk which are completely different. There are entities who will focus only on the transactions. Pure play commerce transactions, which we do either online or offline, how do you bring them in an electronic mode? So there should be a different set of, so all existing regulation, if you see, is focused on settlement base, especially around PPIs. They're not focused on the growth and the risk. So we're trying to work with regulators, and they are working with us very closely, to say that can we have a model where there are entities who will only focus on transactions? Probably they don't need to be regulated like certain other entities. And then there are entities who do this plus remittances. Today, probably domestic, but maybe in future, maybe international. So the risk could be completely different. So what are the additional measures they need to comply with? And then there are entities who will be focused also in addition to this on generating savings and deposits, which is the model which is already conceived in payment bank. So we are trying to create a framework wherein all these three set of entities can coexist, play a role, and the regulation is in proportion to the risk of those three entities. So you will hear from us in next 30 to 60 days about these frameworks we have, once we have finalized these framework with the regulation. So that's what we have been doing in a brief that some of the milestone or the key things that we are working at a PCI. As far as the industry is shifting and my personal view on some of the key aspects in next 12 months, how it will change. There is, there are two points that I just want to make briefly. One is I see many business models getting announced and a lot of actions around trying new models, which is good because if you have a 97% problem, then you definitely need hundreds of models, not just one or two. So which is a good sign. However, what I see and find it a little funny that each of those models are focused on certain entities, whether a payment bank, whether a Jandan, Yojna. So there are very good schemes, models, but they are focused on a certain type of entities while keeping in mind that each one of those are to benefit an underbanked or an unbanked person. So if the end consumer is same and you're creating a model or a BBPS, which is for a common man bill payment, if the end consumer is going to be same and if different entities through different model are going to approach them, and if you don't create an integration amongst them, where there could be a collaboration within non-bank entities or bank and non-bank, probably each one of us will incur cost to acquire that customer and not still have a proper business model which can sustain and grow this. So I see a need that while these models have come as an next phase, somebody will have to work. And probably that somebody is us as an as a industry body along with other stakeholders like regulators and government to integrate this. That how can from a competitive model versus different business model and entities, how do we create a collaborative model? So that's a focus we need to probably bring in. And I'm sure all of you would like to discuss this further. The second point I would like to make, which is not in a context of next 12 months, but probably next 36 months. We had most of the people sitting here are dealing with electronic money in some way or other, with banks, non-banks, and in the ecosystems around it. The fundamental issue of e-money that we see is that it is supposed to replace a physical cash. And when I see it as a base, and I've been making this statement in all nine years every time, that you cannot eradicate cash uses unless you have a product which is stronger than physical cash or a currency, which has a legal tender and has certain characteristics in terms of universal acceptance, simplicity to do transactions up to 50,000 rupees. 
unless you have those characteristics, whatever product you create, you will struggle. So on one side, you will not have a strong business model. On the other side, because each one of those e-money products are managed individually by individual entities, there would be individual entity-based risk. Basis their own governance, basis their own, their own risk mitigation measures. So to address this, we believe today is the era basis the technology development advancement. Probably it's about time we all, along with the RBA and the government, start looking at an era from e-money and leapfrogging to e-currency. That probably could be a game changer where the e-currency has exactly the same characteristics like you have for, for the physical currency. Then you suddenly have a product which actually can definitely displace and has some advantages over physical cash. Until we do it, we, I personally believe that we will struggle with e-money alone and the growth will remain a challenge from a regulator and industry point of view. So these are two key points that I would kind of like to leave behind for all the sessions to discuss and further engage and probably the e-currency part will probably continue for next three years till it is evolved as a right solution for our country. So this year conference coming to specific two-day session, I'm sure we have an interesting lineup of experts, speakers, and you will enjoy the discussion. Uh, however, I would like to just make two additional points. This time the format has slightly changed in the last nine years. Uh, one is the name itself. We've always been calling it Digital Payments and Financial Inclusion Conference. While the focus is not shifted, but we said that let's just make it slightly, slightly modern, looking in the context, and we said this time it is digital money. The objective is same, but it is more around focus digital money, and it could be digital currency next year. So we are going to be dynamic now every year, basis the theme of the year. And we want to have a probably a little dynamic flavor, basis the things that are changing. Uh, besides that, uh, just one last thing I would like to say that this all these work that we are doing at PCI and this event would not have been possible unless we have support from the staff at PCI, unless we have a unless I have a support from all the executive council members at PCI, starting with the with the with the uh, starting with various members uh, like Viswas, who is co-chair, and also is the chairman of our merchant aggregation group. Also Devang, who is co-chair. Rajiv, my co-chair at the PPI group. Uh, also Lori, who is heading uh, the, the white label POS and ATM group, uh, along with him Deepak, and also Sunil, as well as Kiran, who are managing domestic and international money transfer. So I'm sure, uh, just like me, all of you are looking forward to next two days, interesting interaction, and with that, uh, I would again thank all of you to join me and invite Lavis to address us. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank IMAI, Aveen, Mr. Titus, all of you. Great to be here. Um, I've been given a topic to talk about, which thankfully does not have the word financial in it, because I had it, I had nothing to say after what Naveen just elaborated upon. Uh, the term digital inclusion and inclusive growth are the new buzzwords. Well, they haven't been around for roughly, I think, about five odd years. And as the life cycle of buzzwords goes, I think they are yet to approach their peak. I think give it another couple of years. So I think we are going to see a lot more of inclusive growth and, and uh, digital inclusion. I'm supposed to point there. Doesn't work. Ah, there it is. So that what we normally consider inclusive growth to be is essentially opportunities for all. Actually, the term opportunities for all in a, is, in a sense, uh, enshrined in the Indian Constitution, and in the, in, in the terms used are equality of opportunity. But what does this term really mean? And whatever growth that we are seeing right now, is it generating equality of opportunity? Is it not? And I think all of us have been, to some extent, exposed to this large debate uh, of this problem of, the, of increasing inequality, of how growth is leaving behind many people. On another side, people are saying that you know, growth is trickling down, and so on and so forth. But I'd like to unravel this, 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 this not a bit. You see, when we're talking about opportunity, it's not only about creating greater jobs, a greater number of jobs, or increasing incomes. It's that interaction between the outcome of, of a growth process. And I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say there is growth happening in the retail sector and you have the generation of a whole range of retail jobs now, organized retail jobs. Okay. Is that an opportunity or is it not? And that is the question. Because 
if the person who will eventually take up that job is not really capable, uh, either he cannot speak the language or hasn't really been trained and so on and so forth, then that opportunity just goes waste. So essentially the opportunity, whenever we talk about opportunities and whenever we talk about inclusion, it's essentially about capabilities. Do people have the capabilities to actually take, uh, to uh, benefit from these opportunities? And that's been one of the biggest problem that India has had. Even when opportunities do get created, there is a massive capability problem. And that is something that I want to spend some time talking about. Okay. So the issue of opportunities is actually not really, I mean, any growth process will always create an opportunity for you. I mean, of various kinds, there will be opportunities related to jobs, related to innovations, entrepreneurism, and so on and so forth. But I'd like you to look at this, this, this gentleman here. And let's think about all the opportunities that are coming out right now as we speak. Okay? There is a large uh, boom happening in the IT domain. This gentleman here, is that an opportunity for him? And the answer is, of course, it is not, because likely he's not highly educated, he really doesn't have the skills, and so on and so forth. Now, when you think about it, actually all of opportunities can be, can be distilled to three or four issues that the extremely poor face. Okay? Uh, people talk about education and skills and so on, but I'm trying to look at it in a slightly different manner. So the first, the most important, is, is this gentleman aware of what the opportunity is? If he is not, then whatever be the opportunities that might come by, he's not going to benefit. And, and I'll give you a classic example. When the Gulf boom happened in the 70s and 80s, large numbers of people in MP, West Bengal, Bihar, and UP did not actually know about it. So a whole range of employment opportunities abroad got just got dissipated because people in India were not aware of that opportunity. And of course, then you had other countries filling that gap, right? Similarly, uh, you had when the IT boom happened, large numbers of people in North India were not aware of what was happening in Bangalore. Okay? So awareness is one of the first points, and it is the biggest problem in, in, in fast trickle down. Okay? Now that is one problem. Second, skills. I will not talk much more about skills, but it's quite aware that this gentleman does not really have the skills. The third, and this is a bit something that mo most people do not talk about, the problem of coordination. So imagine this gentleman needs to, uh, is going to get a job in the IT sector. Let's also assume that he has the skills, right? To be able to get that job, he needs to coordinate with some either upstream or downstream people. Either he needs to go and interact with someone who's going to be the middleman in trying to get him the job, or he's going to uh, essentially go and try and hire someone in case he's opening, let's say, a small uh, uh, computer uh, repairing out for, uh, uh, shop. Now, does he have the ability to coordinate? The answer is probably not. Okay? Now, here is the another massive problem that we find. Whenever you try and and give, I mean, you can have a market, you can have a road, you can skill people, but if that person cannot coordinate, opportunities will not be possible to, to, uh, to be exploited. The last one is reputation. Any market mechanism requires a reputation. Okay, so even if you were to go and apply for a job, the first thing that anyone uh, would, would, would check would be, what's his background? Uh, has he been involved in any criminal activity? How did he do in his last job? And the poor rarely have coded reputation. You cannot get his reputation, right? So if you cannot, then it'll be very difficult for anyone to hire him. So what happens in this whole growth process is that the poor tend to just get totally alienated from this process simply because these, these links, these mechanisms don't agree, uh, uh, exist. Okay? So I'll move on to the next uh, point. And the idea is that digital inclusion could be that one answer, which could get around many of these problems. Now, when we talk about digital inclusion, there are three fallacies. Okay? The first is that digital inclusion is about digital connectivity. Almost all government documents talk about, as soon as you see the term digital inclusion, they'll use 68.8 million broadband connections, uh, 904 million mobile users, 
Uh, there were a few other numbers that, uh, that, that are thrown about. These are connections. This is not inclusion. It's something like having an electricity con uh, connection. The fact that almost every uh, village in many states of India have an electricity connection doesn't mean that they have electricity, right? So digital inclusion is not about connectivity. First fallacy. Second, and this is something that uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad that I'm not talking about financial inclusion, is that digital inclusion is not financial inclusion. Okay. A whole range, a whole lot of us confuse that. The reason is that financial inclusion piggybacks on digital inclusion. If I did not have digital services of various types running on my mobile or my laptop or whatever, frankly, financial inclusion will not work. Okay, so you need to be able to understand that digital inclusion is a far bigger animal than financial inclusion. Financial inclusion is critical, no two things about it, right? But digital inclusion is not, uh, is, is not the same. The third one is that digital inclusion is not about infrastructure. It's about services. It's about cus uh, customer addressal. It's about what are the kind of services that you're getting on many of these digital domains and so on, right? So, there are these three fallacies we must not get embroiled in, right? So digital inclusion is something that's a far bigger animal, and it has the potential to do far, far more than what all other forms of government programs have ever been able to do. And that takes me to my second slide. Now this is, if you look at these two pictures, it was a Google search, okay? And I typed digital inclusion, and if you look at it, both of these are about financial inclusion. Okay. And that's what has struck me, that actually most of the time these days we are trying to, we are, we are, we are using these terms interchangeably. But the most important point that I needed to uh, make here was that inclusion of digital financial is about services, it is not about infrastructure. The government, the way it is structured, will always tend to have bias towards infrastructure. Okay. It's but natural. However, when you start to create policies which impact the private sector's delivery of services, it can get to be a problem. In fact, uh, the points that you were making, Naveen, about the, the changes in the RBI regulation, all of these are related to services, and all of these have happened in the last one or two years, right? It's only now that the recognition, after 10 or 15 years of, 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 of this thing existing, that the government has recognized that actually services are, 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 the, are, the, are the necessary, or so, rather, the sufficient condition for, for something, uh, for, for growth of uh, inclusion. So that gets me to the next one. There is a problem, even if you had all of these things working, okay? So even if, let's say, you have digital inclusion, everyone has a great mobile uh, device or a laptop, and there are these digital services running on them, uh, and now there is awareness has been built up because you have information on hand, uh, you have skills built up because there are a whole range of services you can access, skill building uh, programs that you can take on your, again, your uh, mobile or your laptop. Uh, you have a coordination possible because now you're a part of social, uh, social network, so the coordination becomes easier for you to do. And of course, uh, you ha it's, it's uh, the fact that you have a history of usage of, uh, of, of a social network, reputation gets easily uh, accessible for anyone to hire. So all of these problems are taken care of, right? You still will have a problem in inclusion. And the problem has, has to do with the problem of, of what I call spatial boundedness. So we need to step out a bit, and I'm take only two more minutes, as if that's fine with you. Imagine a poor person, and imagine your life, okay? What is the critical difference? Of course, they consume less, the poor person is typically has less human capital, and so on. But there's one very, very critical difference, is the space that the poor person uses. A typical poor person will not travel as much as you do. The, the, the area that a person engages is, a few kilometers, okay? In, in a city like Bombay, it might be 10 or 20 kilometers, but even then, this, the amount that a poor person travels is less than you, okay? Now, when that happens, the whole world is bounded. And when the whole world is bounded, the opportunities need to come in the space that this person is in, okay? Now, this is something that most of us tend to miss out, by most of us, I mean uh, people involved in policy, that when you, when you cannot serve him the opportunity in the space that he is in, 
the opportunity is lost. So you cannot have inclusion without appreciating space. Okay? And that's why I wanted to look at this. So there is Dharavi, of course. I got this in the morning uh, from Google Maps. And right next to Dharavi are these uh, is Cyan, and then you have the Air Force quarters and so on. These are middle income or upper middle income neighborhoods, depending upon how you define those. And then you have the poor people, right? Now, that is a great opportunity which Aadhaar will not be able to manage. We all love Aadhaar because Aadhaar provides you identification. But Aadhaar does not tell you who's poor and who's not. Now, for the last five years, the government has had I don't know how many committees, how much debate on who's poor and who's not. Uh, there are all kinds of debates on it and so on. I won't really get onto it. Right now, there are four different definitions of who's poor operating in India, and they're all horrible. Okay, so depending on whom you talk to. Well, so let's forget the definition of who's poor. Let's look at locations. And that's easy because digital technologies allow you to do that. So out here in a map I can see that Dharavi, and it's quite apparent that this is a poor area, right? You don't have to have a PhD in economics to know that Dharavi would be a poor area and this would be a, a, a relatively better off area. However, you can actually do much more. The usage of energy, the use of infrastructure, the use of housing is all lesser for poor people. Okay? And that is what uh, some, some of my colleagues and I, we are doing at Indicus. What we did was we looked at satellite images. Okay? We looked at how much infrastructure exists in certain locations, how, much, how small are habitations or, uh, or places where people live, uh, and also how much of energy they use using nightlights and so on. And we found that in the state of Gujarat, actually the bulk of the poverty is on the periphery. Okay? Uh, in Maharashtra, it is also located in a different manner. But the most interesting thing about satellites is that you can pinpoint down to every 100 meters. You know where the poor are. And once you know where the poor are, even if you don't know who the poor are, you can provide services. And that's where I think the greatest potential for location-based services for policy purposes uh, will, will, will happen. When you can start to marry digital technologies, location-based services, uh, of course the new analytics and big data techniques, and satellite images. So uh, I think there is a great, great set of, uh, uh, set of possibilities that all of these are opening out. And with that, I will end. However, whatever we do, we must not forget. No inclusion is going to happen without language. Language uh, is the key thing. So if, and it, till now India has not mandated uh, in instruments uh, the use of certain languages or a standardization of fonts and so on. So we must appreciate that you cannot have any inclusion happening if you do not speak the language of the person. Uh, Financial inclusion, I think great things are happening. I think give it another one or two years, and I don't think there'll be much more that the government will be able to do. Uh, now it's just a matter of uh, things happening in the telecom space, uh, which include better quality infrastructure, speeds, downtime, customer redressal, and so on and so forth. Uh, the service orientation is something that I think will only happen. It will be an outcome of greater and greater competition, but it will happen. But what is going to be critical here is what I call economical regula regulation. We must not regulate in, at the nascent stage. We must let it flower, and only when things become, start to play up, when you know that, uh, that, that certain successes are, are, are there, that regulation must, must move in. Because we must give space for innovation. Sadly, that's not really been happening in, in, in India. The last and the most important, which hopefully this government will manage, is that you need a coordinated approach. Uh, these are things that you have more than one ministry, more than one regulators involved, and larger coordination is, is, will, will be critical. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Uh, and I, I also thank you for bringing a new dimension about a very different way to look at how do you identify people who are needy. I wouldn't say poor, because in our country, there are as you rightly said, inclusion is not about infrastructure alone. It is more about services. And when you see service delivery, and especially financial services, there's 90% exclusion. So when you look at that, it's not just about poor. It's about who needs that service and who has it. And it's a different dimension to look at it from a, from a GPS perspective or a satellite perspective. It's very interesting. 
and I fully agree with you that it's not just about the opportunity, it's also about the capability. So thank you for sharing this nice uh, keynote. Uh, Ms. Asima is here, so I would request her to please join us on the dais. And I will request Matthew to ad address us. Sorry, I'm just changing the sequence to give a little breathing time to Asima. So. Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks to the Payments Council and Gaurav and others who, are, uh, who took the trouble of inviting me. I'm not one to speak to an audience such as this, uh, so it's always an advantage to have such an opportunity to speak to a completely different sector uh, and an equally fast-growing uh, industry uh, body and, uh, and the economic section. Um, could we have Lavish's last slide on? Is it possible or you all took it off? Uh, I thought Lavish was making an important point and since I come from a slightly uh, different field, uh, I think he made an important point about uh, the significance of, of regulation and uh, the chair had talked about that in the beginning uh, as we're looking at these new licenses that are there. Uh, Lavish, however, I would like to say that, you know, seeing what we have gone through in the microfinance sector, I would think that it's important for you all to put that as number one in this segment. Only because, you know, we kind of grew and then when the state came down, you know, and I don't know if there are many bankers over here, uh, the bankers are provisioning starting September of last year for $1.3 billion, which is 7,200 crores of assets were destroyed overnight by bad regulation. Uh, it's not being talked about publicly because banks are taking the hit, they're provisioning every quarter, but it's important to recognize that as your market segment grows, uh, there are hidden risks in that, and the political economy risk, I think, is extremely significant. And we are seeing that in the mining sector also where lots of investments have been made and they're not able to capture the benefits of those investments uh, as quickly as they thought they did. So let me kind of go back to, I think, what I was trying to uh, call your attention to. Uh, clearly, I think uh, Lavish's uh, presentation has highlighted this whole uh, segment of the poor, talked about the nature of the demand, and I won't dwell much on that. Uh, I think clearly in India we are witnessing great opportunity and I think uh, great challenges. Um, every day you hear about the next great entrepreneur and where that next great entrepreneur will emerge from. And there are predictions that possibly some of those great entrepreneurs might emerge from your field, which is the field of payments. And everybody is extremely optimistic about how these number of cash transactions are going to go to digital and possibly emergence of these new institutions such as these payments banks which will be the depository of such transactions. So clearly there is great opportunity. But I think that fundamentally translating that opportunity into a firm, into something that captures that opportunity, is able to take the benefits to a larger audience is going to be the key. And the key is really not going to be in the old cut and paste approach. I think it's going to be, the differentiator is going to be your ability to ask the right question, your ability to define your problem clearly and address it in the most innovative fashion. And I think that one of the great stories that I keep telling in my sector is Premchand's Namaka Doroga. I don't know if you all have read that. But there's a great tension in that story between the father and the son. And I think that father and the son tension is really the tension of asking a different question and saying there's a new way to address this problem. Right? So the son refuses to follow what the father is saying and alternatively says there's a new path. He gets bashed up pretty badly. He loses half the plot, but he wins in the end. Right? But that tension of asking a different question is actually going to determine your ability to succeed in this financial services market. And I think it's important to take that forward as you look at what you're going to be doing. Now, since we've talked about the demand 
in the previous uh, presentation, I will focus on, I think, what are some of these key differentiators that we need to look at. I think the first important thing is to segment the market. It is time and again observed that everything we do is really cut and paste, scale it down to size. So what works for the middle class market, you kind of zip it down and then you think that you will approach it for the low income household or you will approach it for the poor. I think mistake number one is that. You really can't start zipping similar products and services down to different segments of the market. You need to look at that slide that Lavish was bringing up in the beginning and see what are the unique features that exist in that customer segment and what is it that you can bank on. And the two points you talked about was skill and awareness. Those are your differentiators. So the product that you come across when you talk to me, say, as a client, is different because I'm able to compute, I'm able to understand, I'm able to have much more awareness as opposed to a poor man. So the skill and awareness differentiator is extremely important, both in the way that you define your product and in the way you communicate it. It's extremely important to work with that. In the microfinance sector, one of the unique things that we found is the way we succeed is because you do the same product day in and day out. Sometimes people say you are not meeting the demands of the poor household. True, we are possibly not meeting it. But what we are fitting into it is what is his skill level and what is his awareness level? Iterated transactions is what you need. The same thing day in and day out, till he gets it right. The day he's frustrated, he'll move to a different product segment. He'll move to a different institution. And if you're ready with the second institution and the second service, well and good. You can then meet that demand. But at least your product and your income line are stable. And I think as a firm, it's important for you to both look at your product and your income line, you know, so that your top, top line and bottom line both kind of grow at the same time. So it's important to fit what you are doing to the demand. And I think one of the key things that I'll focus on, and I want you to take away from this, is that it's important that we focus less on supply and more on demand in the initial stages of trying to build an industry. And that is the central part of my critique with most government schemes. We begin by defining what is it that we can offer without too much damage, rather than asking what is it that actually people need. So to the point of this Jandhan Yojana, there was another scheme three years ago that was a similar variant of this. In that, close to, I think, 35 million accounts were opened. Out of the 35 million, 30 million were dormant, or something like 27 million were dormant. Eight or nine million were active. Out of the eight or nine million that were active, five to six million were existing people who had transferred. So the incremental amount was just two million. But did we look at what those two million people were doing? Did we look at where they came from before we rolled out the new strategy? In fact, Samir Kocher had this uh, big analogy saying that the advertising campaign was 100, 100 crores and the outstanding at the end of three years was 110 crores. So the net beneficiary was these advertising agencies. I hope it's different this time. But essentially, we need to look at segments, products and services, and learn from what we did wrong. Or what is it that we need to add to that product in that segment before we roll out a new product? And I think it's important to have seen what those poor people were doing at that level before we kind of presented the next round of the Jandan Yojana. Because I think the point is, opening a bank account is not to financial inclusion, because until and unless you don't have the repeated transactions, the person is not part of the system. You can open the account, but if it doesn't go back to that institution, if it doesn't go back to that service, it's as good as dead. Because all you have done is you you build this whole sunk costs that can't be recovered through any service or product. So it's important to think about how you look at each segment and what is it that you have to offer. And it's classic because, you know, in India we talk about the microfinance sector, but I have this lovely story and everybody knows about it. You just need to dig out and find out what Syndicate Bank did. They got local kids. They wanted to work in the agriculture segment. So every graduate, every PO that they employed before they got nationalized, and when Mr. Pai was running this, was an agriculture graduate from 
the southern Kannada region. And they specialized in different products. There were no maths quiz that they thought they could just hire a few accountants to sort it out. And that's what they did. They focused on agriculture. Everybody was an agriculture graduate in the initial stages. They went from 1% to 4% of the deposits. And if you're going to be looking really at that segment, that is what you want to be looking at. How did they manage these deposits? Because under the payment banks, you're going to get the potential of collecting deposits. The second thing is the regularity of collection, which is very similar to what we do in microfinance. They had the pygmy, bank, pygmy deposit collectors. These guys used to turn up at the doorstep day in and day out at regular frequency, which is what Sahara and others also do. So you can mimic it. But the point is, how do you do it and how do you do it well? But Syndicate Bank demonstrates both on the deposit side and on the lending side, essentially, how to crack that market. And I think it's important that we kind of look at some of those ideas very carefully before we kind of jump in and see what we can do really in that marketplace. The other thing as you all go forward, as the way you think about your sector, is this whole thing about SROs. I think it's important that the debate on the SROs is separated from the firms that work over there. Uh, so while you have all the companies that are doing and doing well, it's important to build an understanding of the nature of the SRO that needs to be there. You can have an SRO based on all payment providers, but also there'll be problems or differentiators based on size. The guys who are big will be able to deal with things differently. The guys who are small will be able to do things differently. The cost of transactions based on geography will be different for each of you. So as you think about the SRO, I think it's important that you build these differentiators and look at what these elements are that challenge you all mostly and see how you can kind of bring them together in a manner before the central bank gets onto you all or before the state governments get onto you all. Because there are funny clauses that actually keep some of the supervisory capability of financial services, especially for the low income segment, in the hands of the state. So don't be surprised if a local state government or functionary turns up one day and decides under some obscure law to take action against you. So it's important to do that differentiator because your cost structures will be different. So before you kind of go to the Reserve Bank, it's important that you capture some of those costs. And therefore, it comes, brings me to that one recommendation that I would have for you all is build your data sets properly. Uh, work on your data sets so that you're able to capture the differences and capture the nature of entities that each of you all represent. Because it's not going to be the same. Uh, capital and other things will be determinant, but also you know, the geographies in which you work will be extremely crucial. So it's important that you think through some of those issues. Finally, the point that was made about, um, about uh, converting cash to the electronic form. A lot of optimism exists over there, but there, are, uh, there is, I think the way we need to think about it again is very different. Like, you know, the whole cash transaction, moving that on to an electronic platform is not going to be as easy as it seems. Uh, there's been a detailed study that we had access to which looked at almost 18,000 transactions in the M-Pesa system in Kenya. And they found that the central piece of those transactions were transactions between relatives, as opposed to transactions which are business or economic in consideration. And every time they probed that, they found that the problem with that was that people did not trust a financial institution, that's an issue that they kept making out to be, but also they were not sure of the way the transaction would happen between them and say a service provider. So 90% of the transactions that were happening was for remittance for me to my father, to my mother, to whatever it is. So it was to meet emergency needs. Primarily, that was, this, that was the basis of that. So the way to describe it was that the e-cash ecosystem was a mile wide, but an inch thick. So it's spread across the place, but it's just focused on one kind of one type of it's definitely not used for savings. So you really might want to think about 
the savings rules that are being embedded in the payment bank system. Because that will eat into your capital, that will affect the way your firm is and the way that your firm can be profitable. So it's, uh, there's a big catch over there, and I just want to caution you all to think about uh, the capital requirements on the deposit side for payment banks. Because people, the experience shows that people really don't use it for savings. Uh, I think the key really, and the investment that we need to be making as a sector is on the point that was made earlier about building skills and awareness of our particular customer segment. While it is uh, not necessarily the duty of a firm, but in the absence of the government spending money, they, you know, unfortunately there are large amounts of money being spent for financial inclusion, for financial literacy. This money never finds its way out to the people. You know, the biggest beneficiary really, and I say this with a great deal of skepticism, has been the advertising agencies. Because you look at any financial inclusion ad, it's running on the economic and business channels. Now, I, my sense is economic and business channels are watched by people like you and me. No poor person is ever going to be watching that. Why are we spending all this money on these business channels? You should be looking at regional media. You should be looking at alternative media to educate people about financial transactions. And if you are serious about building the financial services market, that is where we all need to put our weight behind. We need to ensure that people have a sense of the institutions, the firms, what is the regulation, what is the supervision, how does this market work. The poor people need to understand that. So many of our kids, so many of our parents have problems with even the banking system. How much more will the poor person have it? So if we really are talking about financial inclusion, we need to ensure that all this money that is set aside for awareness and building doesn't target us again, but rather targets the poor person. And that is where I think that client-related education will serve in reducing your own self-regulatory costs. Otherwise, your costs on supervision, on decreasing fraud, all of your internal risk costs will be extremely high, which is what I've seen in our balance sheets. So it's important for you that the benefit of building the marketplace is something which will actually benefit and make your own firm, your own intervention much more profitable. But I think the focus it's going to be extremely important, and that is where many a time you need to step aside from beyond your nose into seeing what the payments ecosystem is and how best you can go and make that work for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. I think uh, some very important points you made. Uh, one was to start with economical regulation. I'm sure we're all working with regulators now with all the new regulation coming in. Thanks for sharing that view. And also, some of the key points that you made uh, around SRO, I think it's an interesting point as we are going that path. And yes, you're right, there are different type of business models, different entities, different cost structures, different focus. So we have to make sure there is a flexibility to adhering the principle at the same time not affecting the fundamental business model of those entities. So, and I think we all know there is a financial inclusion, which I could probably, if you use the word political, and which is what actually is a real. And we all know it. I think some of us talk more loudly, some of us remain silent about it. And I always keep wondering that if somebody is buying a train ticket or paying his utility bill, which otherwise he cannot do using any other service, why is not that a financial inclusion? But if you give him a bank account where probably in the whole year he's transacting 150 rupees, that is an inclusion. There the government gives you subsidy, money, but if you do everything else, and as you rightly said, this whole ECAS, the biggest beneficiary is government. Why aren't they that supporting that? So thanks for sharing that, uh, your nice views and experience and the comments. I would request now Asima to address us. Thank you. So I think this, this audience, uh, it's, uh, it's good to start with the theme of innovation because um, you're all working in the market and you're going to do small, small things that can really make a difference to your customers. And I think that uh, for financial inclusion, innovations that me meet real needs are absolutely essential, and they should be affordable and accessible. And such inclusion, if it's need-based in in innovation, then it really helps, uh, creates conditions, improves productivity, improves growth in the economy as a whole. The mobile is a prime example of such an innovation which has been ado adopted by all income classes. And it has many applications to financial inclusion, to money transfers and so on. So it's puzzling that this has not really happened. 
that's an issue which we all have to think about and how can we change it. So I've done some research in this area where I looked at the interaction between market size and inclusive innovation. The two sort of feed into each other. There are interactive loops because if there's a large market, then you, it pays, it, it's profitable to innovate for it. And if you innovate for the market, its size increases. And it can be a sort of virtuous loop. So although mobiles grew tremendously, and there was a tremendous interaction from the private sector in this, from 37 million in 01, it grew to above 900 in currently. But uh, in financial inclusion, this has not happened. And I suggest that there are two major reasons for this. One is that regulations were not fine-tuned towards increasing the market size. Second, there were serious gaps in infrastructure, the, re the relevant infrastructure. And here, because there are externalities, you and I are not going to build this infrastructure because we don't get all the returns from it. It goes to others. So this is the economic concept of externality, and therefore the government has to play a role here. So if we turn to infrastructure, then the broadband, rural, if you're talking about financial inclusion, rural teledensity is important. This remains below 50%. And even in cities, in, in 2013, for example, I was just comparing in Mumbai, the broadband quality was, uh, was worse than in the average US city, but it was six times more expensive. There's a recent RBI survey on villages, this focus on, uh, increasing bank presence in villages. But for the mobile to work or for uh, a, a bank or any kind of money transfer, you need electricity. And still only 55% is the elect electricity coverage. In the really poor areas such as UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Assam, 77% of the villages are not electrified. The rural share of ATMs is only 14%. Business correspondence, which has been the preferred mode for inclusion in rural areas, still cover only 50% of villages. So India is underbanked. These bricks and mortar, uh, it's very difficult to really uh, pick that up very quickly, the current kind of targets that are in the air. But still, there is a great potential for financial inclusion, especially financial services, not just banks, not just savings account, not just remittances, but a whole range of services. So uh, the survey shows that although 74% of villagers have savings account, but only 34% use loan facilities, only 24% use remittances, only 12% used overdraft facilities, the current Jandhan talks about and electronic benefit transfers only 15%. So although this is, these are very low figures, but again, it suggests that there is great potential. So these are just some figures that show that although teledensity has been rising, while wireless subscribers have increased phenomenally, teledensity in rural areas is still, still, still much below that in urban and below 50%. When we talk about mobile transfers, the regulatory space has been more concerned about mobile banking. And uh, one of the reasons was the concern of uh, the regulator that uh, for, for customer security and for this long-term vision of providing more financial services. So rather than just transfers, if the MSP, the mobile service provider, is linked to a bank, then you can offer a bank account with all the other, other services that can go with it. And moreover, they were unwilling to allow deposit holding by non-banks. Customization, innovation in Pakistan, higher levels and limits, more income categories, wider BC universe, and then most important, low transaction costs for customers. You know, people think that the poor have a lot of time to spare, but that's not true. My maid will not use ration rice because she says she doesn't have time to clean it, there are too many stones in it. You know, so you have to make it easy for, for people to open those accounts. Uh, and here they remove the, the necessity for physical presence for registration, which is very, very well. Here our KYC processes are very, are very, very cumbersome. And so all of this led to a cumulative kind of improvements in products and expansion in market size. 
What was the experience in other countries? M Pesa really worked in Kenya, it did not work in, in Nigeria. And like, much like the Indian case in Nigeria, it was regulator led. So was it the problem of too much regulations or was it the, the fine tuning in, in those regulations? So although in Kenya 70% use, but you know, to just look at the figures is interesting. In India we have 900 million people who have mobile accounts. So uh, mobile, we use mobiles. In, in Kenya, the 17% just amounts to 17 million people. So the potential market is so huge in India. In a way, in, in Kenya, there is only one service provider, so the advantage of monopoly, they are able to reach a critical mass. And these kind of uh, activities, network effects. So, uh, so uh, it, uh, it really helped the services take off in Kenya. But overall, in the world as a whole, from about 200 experiments in mobile transfers, only four or five have actually worked. So this, this issue of reaching a critical mass and building up a range of uh, activities is very important. In India, both the MPSA has come in since 11, 12, which is yet to scale up. So um, although this, how to, how to build, how to achieve this scale up, in most countries, regulators work to enhance competition, which tends to keep prices low. Kenya prices are quite high. And they build for the long run, allowing multiple financial services. But regulators can't do it by themselves. They have to make it easy for business, and business has to work to innovate. So in India, also things can change, because in some ways, there are new trends. There are a lot of possible, uh, possibilities today especially in digital money in retail. And there are all sorts of changes in technology which allow easier cash transfers, more security, and uh, uh, the cloud, new products. In India, where people are very price sensitive, the smartphones prices are really crashing from about 20,000 now available for below 5,000 rupees. And expected sales in the near future in India could be about 500 million. So it's a huge potential market. Then the other change is that a lot of non-bank players, international players such as Google and Apple coming in. While for one of the regulatory clouds in the issue of making international transfers easier. And here the security and KYC and so on has, has but the bank link, even for non-bank non providers, can give regulatory comfort and perhaps make cross-border transactions easier. Then there are issues, industry level issues, such as common standards, help build a critical mass, help attract new customers, and cooperation in, in, can give economies a scale and scope and can reduce, help reduce costs. The other big change here is in customer behavior. I think Matthew is telling us how in MPSA it is all relative. But you see a big beginning in, in, uh, in e-commerce. Yeah? And then mobile payments or, or electronic payments can be very, 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 very helpful. And having just spent two hours in a traffic jam trying to get here, I know the comforts in the Indian context of just sitting at home and buying something and paying online. So this is there's going to be a huge change in customer behavior. And I don't think it's correct to say that the poor will not pick up or are not aware. You need financial literacy. But if there's a convenience, something that gives them a real convenience, a smartphone that allows them to do this on their mobile, which everyone has, I think they will enter this market also. And so the other change, apart from customer behavior and technology, the other exogenous factor that really drives change in this area is, of course, regulations. Now here, again, we are seeing some hopeful changes in India. The, from the Indian, Indian uh, pa Pakistan experience, you can see that, that regulations that encourage content, content creation and widespread participation are critical. Now the government has announced the Jan Dhan, and in a way, although this is target-oriented and can largely give money to ad agencies and so on, but the big change here is that because of this long-run view, in, in Kenya, it might be, MBSA might be used only for remittances, but in India, if you can link money transfers and digital money to provision of a range of financial services, 
Because how do you lift people out of poverty? Just giving them a transfer today is not going to help. Just opening a bank account today is not going to help. One of the main things that create poverty is suppose you have an accident and you can't afford the health costs, so it health accident insurance. That is linked with Janghan. They use the rupee card and overdraft. Or prime need in poor areas is liquidity. You need to have, and that is why the money lender has not gone out of the system. So liquidity, provision of liquidity, overdraft, if they learn how to use it. So you need financial literacy and awareness. But uh, the point is that there is a range of products being or financial services being offered now, not just opening a bank account. So this might help reach that critical mass. It might create opportunities for a lot of private business, but they need to innovate and make use of it and achieve this kind of virtuous. In many countries, financial inclusion has, has driven business, has created a lot of business opportunities. Perhaps this can happen in India also. So we have a large population, huge market, potential market size, and uh, the kind of business model that will work here is low margin, large scale. All of you need to think about that and how you can deliver such products. So there are changes on the horizon, Reg regulations will become more helpful. There's, there needs to be regulatory awareness also. And as a rise in market size induces innovation in affordable products. And the point is that as business uh, participates and this is less driven by regulators or subject to bureaucratic delays, then um, it's less, less hostage to policy errors and the whole process can be much more robust. And in India we suffer from many kinds of poor governance, so more use of e-facilities in all spheres can help improve public services more generally. So the technological changes, behavioral changes, all favor this meaningful inclusion, which I like to call active inclusion. And I think what all of us can contribute is if we innovate and improve work, use this market size, expand it further, create more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for sharing the comparison between India and Pakistan successfully. We don't like that comparison, but hopefully it will wake us up. There are things we are behind. And thanks for sharing the initial points that what could make it change. So we have Mr. Subir Bokan joining us from video at 11, I think just about a couple of minutes. I'm not sure whether we will have enough time for Q&A today, because 11.30 is another panel. So we will see if we get 5-10 minutes after the session, we will try or rather we will try and give you the break. I think uh, Mr. Subir Bokan is already online. I will request him to address us. Thank you sir, over to you. Uh, thank you. Can I, am I audible? And yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak. I believe I have uh, roughly 15 minutes, if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. I'll try and uh, you know, use the pattern optimally. Uh, the, the topic I was given was uh, roadblocks to financial inclusion. And I think uh, given where we are on the pathway, uh, I don't think we need to think of it in terms of roadblocks. I think we have to think of it in terms of milestones. Because it's an open course now. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the, the, the field is new, it's virgin territory for the most part. Uh, uh, whatever you've done so far, clearly there have been successes and failures. Uh, and uh, you know we, we, we have to draw some lessons from the experience, but uh, we've covered far less distance than we have yet to cover, uh, and that's really more of an opportunity uh, context than a constraint or a bottleneck uh, context. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a framework. I'm going to use a framework to talk about uh, you know, what we uh, need to do uh, to achieve meaningful inclusion uh, at the level at which clearly the government, not just it's not just government, it's I think a social aspiration. Uh, everybody should have access, meaningful access to finance. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a very reasonable and legitimate uh, objective. Uh, so uh, let me lay out my framework. Uh, some of you may have read my column in yesterday's business standard uh, for the inclusion track. 
And that's essentially what uh, I use as a framework to talk about inclusion. So let me lay it out. Uh, if you've read it, apologies. If you haven't read it, well, this is this is uh, going to be uh, new material. Uh, the uh, three dimensions. I, I, I like to use the triangle as a metaphor because uh, a triangle is the smallest number of lines that you uh, can bound the space with. And to me, inclusion is all about boundaries. Uh, if you're not within the boundaries, you're excluded. If you're within the boundaries, you're included. And uh, so when, when we think of include, an inclusion strategy, we think, thinking about expanding the area within the triangle to bring people who are outside it into it. That is, to me, a very straightforward uh, conceptual definition of, English, of uh, inclusion. And I think that's what we need to think about, or that's the way we need to think about financial inclusion. So what are the sides of the triangle of financial inclusion? That's essentially what I'm going to talk about. Now, uh, I think there are three sides to it. Uh, I will call them, uh, labeling is always subjective, but I will call them uh, product, delivery, and awareness. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about each of these, uh, these sides. Uh, on the product side, uh, I think our experience so far and our approach so far, with complete legitimacy, I am not, uh, you know, pointing fingers or making criticism here, but I'm just saying that the first step in in uh, in providing access was seen as uh, opening bank accounts. And from 2008-9 or thereabouts till uh, this year, uh, the metric for inclusion has been bank accounts. Now, uh, accounts are essentially channels. They create a linkage, but they in and of themselves don't provide any content. Uh, so when we talk about meaningful inclusion, uh, we have to combine the existence of an account uh, with something that flows through that channel. Now the debate on inclusion about this content has essentially focused on four attributes or four uh, products stroke services. Uh, there is a savings product, uh, there is a credit product, there is an insurance product, and there is a pension product. Uh, so the idea is, once you've created the channel, you plug the person into the system, uh, how do you get things flowing through that system? Now, I think one of the learnings that we uh, have to take from our experience so far is that just the mere fact of opening a uh, an account, or in other words, creating the channel, uh, did not actually result in anything flowing through. Uh, and uh, I think that's a very important lesson because it suggests that the product cannot be defined as the account. The product must be something that actually flows through the account. So given this, we move from the concept of financial inclusion to meaningful financial inclusion. Meaningful financial inclusion meant, you know, not only is the account open, but there is actually something that is flowing through it. Uh, I mean, that was a bit of an artificial distinction, but you know it was made, and, and so we, we live with it. But uh, in 2012, uh, in November 2012, uh, there was a function. I was part of that function uh, in Ernakulam, in Kerala, uh, to celebrate Ernakulam as the first district in the country to achieve meaningful financial inclusion. Uh, what did this mean actually? It didn't mean that everybody had access to all these four product categories. It meant that everybody had an account and that large numbers, perhaps small in percentage terms, but you know, significant numbers of people actually were starting to use those accounts to access one or more of these uh, product categories. And that was celebrated uh, as, as uh, an achievement of meaningful inclusion. Now, this is essentially therefore a two-step process that we're following. First, open the account and then worry about what flows through it. Uh, what the JDY has done, and this is essentially the thrust of my, my comment yesterday, uh, is that it has compressed the two step into one. Uh, it has opened an account, but along with the account, you're getting an insurance product, which is both on the general side and the life side. And most importantly, to me, the most important attribute of the JDY is the overdraft, because that is immediately creating a credit product along with the opening of an account, which did not exist in the previous framework. The previous framework did not guarantee you access to credit. Now you might think that 5,000 rupees is a negligible number. Well, for us it is. 5,000 rupees as a credit plan is, is unimportant. But if you're looking at the constituency of inclusion, 
Uh, I think rupees as a credit line is, as a revolving credit line is actually quite substantial. Uh, people who do transactions on daily on a daily basis, a vegetable vendor or, or uh, you know any anybody who's trading at relatively small volumes, uh, a daily overdraft facility of five thousand, you know, revolving essentially a revolving facility, actually can add up to quite a bit. You we know from anecdotal evidence, perhaps you know surveys and so on, that the interest rates on informal sector credit are very high. Uh, not because uh, you know uh, there is uh, uh, people are getting ripped off in any way, but because of that level of transaction, that level of capital investment, returns on capital are also extremely high. If you pay 10% effectively a day, your return on that capital is probably 15 or 20 or 30 percent. Uh, and so the market emerges, uh, the market functions where people are paying 10% daily rate and earning on that an ROC uh, E of, uh, of 25, 30, maybe more. Uh, so the key here is how does that overdraft facility, in a sense, substitute or replace or displace uh, existing channels of credit provision? Uh, firstly, at a level of viability, certainly which means that the interest rate has to be presumably relatively high, but at the same time competitive. That is, it can actually uh, induce people to move from informal sector channels to formal channels. Uh, that's, I think, where the issue of product comes in. The insurance products are obviously uh, also piggyback on the account. Uh, the second dimension that I want to highlight in the product design issue is uh, the risk management. Who bears the risk of this? Uh, you know, if you're giving out credit, you are taking on credit risk. Uh, banks are, of course, equipped to uh, to take on credit risk. They have all of the systems in place to take on credit risk. But can they actually deliver this product meaningfully? Uh, is a question. So, how do we combine the uh, the uh, delivery mechanism, which is my second issue, uh, with the ability to take on credit risk? So I think from a design perspective, the overdraft facility is something that is a step forward, significant step forward. I think it will do more to uh, to pursue the, to further the cause of uh, inclusion than just the mere uh, opening of an account, a significant contribution, but it has to be placed in an appropriate institutional context, uh, which, which addresses specifically uh, the issue of credit risk. So let me move then to the delivery side of the triangle. Uh, what do we mean by delivery? Uh, what is the big, big advantage that the informal sector has vis-a-vis -vis delivery? Uh, I think the its strongest point uh, and strongest attribute is its ability to deliver on the doorstep. Banks don't deliver on the doorstep. They never used to historically. The ATM pushed that uh, cause a little bit. Now, of course, if you want the bank to come to your house, you know you you have to be a high net worth individual. It's not the bank is not going to come to your doorstep if you're in this inclusion constituency. Uh, so, how do you get the financial system to deliver credit or other services to the doorstep? I think that's the critical issue on the delivery side. Uh, in, in most of my interactions with uh, with the inclusion constituency, I keep using that term. Uh, when I visited uh, villages which, which had no bank grants and so on. The biggest problem that people faced was the time factor. This is well known that if it takes you a day to execute a bank transaction, the value of that service is extremely limited. Uh, so people complain about having to travel long distances to get to a branch, having to be there within certain hours of the day, otherwise they, they lost and they didn't get access. All of those problems need to be solved. The business cost part clearly is one way to do it. But it's not the only way to do it. Uh, we have uh, use of uh, microfinance, we have business correspondence, we have telecom companies, we have uh, prepaid uh, instruments. Everybody has an attribute. All of these channels have attributes that allow them to provide doorstep uh, delivery, either in real terms or in virtual terms, whichever. It doesn't matter which way they're, they're providing that delivery. But I think the idea of the delivery mechanism is to be completely agnostic. We just don't have enough experience. Let's, let's, let's accept the reality that we don't have enough experience now to determine which one works better in what, what context. So the only way to deal with this is to be as experimental as possible, to be able to allow different channels to 
uh, to try the, the services in different contexts and in some situations some will work better and others others will work better let's accept that as a possible outcome and let that process of evolution and and uh, success and failure actually determine what the eventual structure of this last mile delivery framework is going to be but the last mile delivery framework as eclectic and as uh, varied as it might be must be backed up by a relatively robust system and this is where I think the two-stage wholesale retail framework is very important to consider that the banking system to my mind provides an effective wholesale component. Uh, it is able to, uh, to aggregate uh, so that it, from a scale efficiency viewpoint it, it does meet its conditions, may meet its requirements and it is able to take on the risk. Uh, securitization is going to play a very important role here. We have been very, very wary about securitization, particularly after the 2008 crisis. But I don't think we should throw the baby out of the bathwater there. Uh, certain kinds of securitization used within relatively prudent uh, boundaries uh, will help to achieve this wholesale retail linkage. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. So are we talking about delivery? We're talking not about the banks playing an exclusive role, we're talking about banks providing a sort of wholesale component, a wholesale foundation on which a whole range of retail uh, channels, the ones that I mentioned, maybe payment banks comes in, come into that picture as well. But we should be completely agnostic about that last mile uh, segment and you know, let it, let it, let a thousand plus bloom or uh, whatever, uh, you know, aphorism you want to use to describe it. But uh, what we need to make sure is that the risk management functions, the risk management responsibilities are very effectively handed over to the banking system, which then is able to use its uh, capabilities and its systems uh, to manage that risk. Uh, finally, on the awareness side, I think the key issue, and you know, financial literacy is being talked about industry, and there are many people who are, who are uh, doing this. Uh, lots of comics that the Reserve Bank of India publishes, I know SEBI does a lot of this. Uh, not sure it's it's reaching, but you know, let's not forget that uh, everybody deals with financial services. They just don't deal with the formal financial sector. Uh, so I don't think we should worry about people's ability to understand costs and benefits. That's not an issue. I think the big challenge on financial awareness is the understanding and communicating and, and instilling understanding of the consequences of not living up to contracts. Uh, the, the biggest problem that this whole strategy is going to have is when you start talking about how default is going to be treated. Uh, you know, loan waivers are a sort of extreme example of, of mass default engineered by, by the establishment. But uh, default has a very powerful demonstration effect. If people get away with defaults, everybody is going to be tempted to try. So I think the key element of financial awareness in this whole inclusion strategy is the emphasis on the sanctity of contracts. That if you don't abide by the terms of your contract, whatever they may be, uh, you of course should be exposed to the, the, the implications of the terms of the contract, but once you have accepted them, if you don't abide by them, then there are going to be serious consequences, your access to the system is actually uh, shut off. Now if, if you can't enforce that, uh, you run into all kinds of uh, challenges uh, with the overall viability of the, of the scheme. Uh, so those are the three sides of the conclusion triangle that I want to lay before you. These, as I said, uh, there, are, there are lots of learnings from the uh, from the first stage of the process, which was, you know, let's open accounts. That's all very well, but can we ensure that something flows through them? Uh, we couldn't do that. We now have a bundling, a packaging of an account with specific products. I think that's a step forward, but that raises certain challenges with respect to, as I said. Risk management, in particular, uh, uh, and also requires us to be somewhat innovative about uh, the delivery methods. So, to address that problem, uh, I visualize a sort of wholesale retail arrangement with banks playing a very important role as the backstop, as the wholesale component, and everybody in the game uh, for the retail component. Uh, and finally, the awareness side 
it's an issue of uh, contract enforcement, the sanctity of contracts. That once you're into the system, you have to live by the contract. Uh, I don't think we're emphasizing that uh, requirement enough. Uh, it's very tempting to forgive default, to write it off, but that is going to undermine the, uh, the viability of, of, the, of the strategy. Uh, of course, a lot of people, a lot of well-known people have uh, been quite skeptical about the Jandhan Yojana, uh, saying that this is just another uh, big you know, giveaway. And certainly there are risks that that uh, might happen. Uh, but uh, the way to mitigate that risk, the way to avoid it, the way to try and get the maximum out of this, uh, this, this particular combination uh, is to design it right. And uh, these three sides of the triangle to me are the basic design components uh, of a successful scheme. I hope it works. I think uh, we have a lot to lose as a system, as an economy, uh, and as a society. If we deny people meaningful financial access, this is, I think, the first step in that direction. And I certainly think, uh, I hope that is successful. So let me stop with that. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to, to speak. And I wish you, you know, all success in your uh, in the rest of your seminar. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. I believe you can take one or two questions, sir, if it is okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I think we just have about five minutes. So I will allow actually a couple of questions on the floor to Mr. Sri Gopan or any other panelist here. Uh, okay, first one here. Please state your name and the question you are addressing to and state the question, please. Yeah, my, uh, my name is Randu Parwal. Uh, my question was to Mohit and as well to Matthew. Uh, Matthew, I was, uh, when this Jan Dhoni Yojana was announced, uh, the same day my driver, who sits with the entire group there at, uh, towards DN Road, he basically came back and came with the form of the evening and he said, sir, I mean, 5,000 rupees ka loan mil jayega free mein, saath mein insurance mil jayega. <coughs> My question to him was, with this Jandan Yojana and there are some 10-12 guys who filled up the forms and he came to fill up the forms. My question to you was, uh, in, the Jandan, in this Yojana, how many people or how many accounts, 1.5 crore was the media coverage, that 1.5 crore accounts opened, which part of India and how much was from the rural penetration? And uh, was it some clients or some guys who already had account also opened accounts in the scheme? So we'll start with Subir's answer and then come to Matthew. Sir? Well, I, I don't, I haven't really kept uh, track of the numbers, but uh, I think the two issues that have been raised, important ones. One is that uh, do these facilities apply only to new accounts? Uh, are the old accounts in some sense denied these uh, these privileges? And I think we did not have clarity on that for a while, which obviously induced uh, people to open a new account because they didn't weren't sure that they would get privilege. Uh, but I think there has been some clarification on that. I'm not 100 percent certain of this, but uh, I have heard is uh, now uh, equal treatment. If you if you have an account, a no frills account, then all of the privileges announced at the JD by applied you. So that reduces the need to duplicate. And uh, the second question is the urban rule. Uh, there were something like 100, uh, 750, 770 sites where these accounts are open. Uh, ultimately, I don't think it matters urban rule or, or regional distribution. I think what matters is whether the people who open accounts uh, find value in dealing with the organized sector. Now, if they find value because they get the overdraft and they're able to use that overdraft to increase their income and you know pay the pay the loan back, and this transaction doesn't become a hassle, uh, they're going to use it. Uh, if they don't find value, in other words, the, somehow the system, you know, in theory the privileges are uh, are the services are provided, but in practice it's very difficult. And this has this happened with so many schemes. So you know, let's not underestimate the significance of this. That you keep, uh, you you have something in theory, but in practice it doesn't work. Then nobody's going to use it. So so it becomes an empty shell. And I think that is uh, what the the people who are running this uh, scheme have to be very conscious of that. 
value is pretty, if, if people see value in it, if people realize value from it, they will use it, and I think that's how we achieve uh, the objectives. So I, uh, I, you know, I quite concur with some of the skepticism that underlay your question. Uh, if you look at uh, the earlier scheme that was done in the UPA regime, uh, the 3.5 billion accounts that they had opened, uh, almost 70 percent uh, were accounts that were not active. Uh, out of that, like I said, only 10 percent were the incrementally new accounts. So I would just use those same numbers to say that uh, within the 1.5 crore that we got this time, I would suspect the one, you know, 10 percent to 20 percent might be, you know, given the benefit of doubt, push it to 20 percent would be incrementally new accounts. Uh, my sense is your driver already has two accounts, if not more. Um, I think the main thing that we tend to forget, this is what I, is that we think that we are operating in a backbone. Now, your driver will also have already existing loans from not only a money lender over here, but a money lender from his village. Uh, because he has, he's a first generation migrant, he's taken money and come here. So there are two loans he's operating with. Uh, so, and each of those loan sizes, my sense is run between 25 and 30,000. Uh, so, the incremental benefit of a 5,000 uh, amount is essentially one that, you know, I'll get that free and if you ask him what it is, my sense is he doesn't have any intention to return the 5,000 rupees. Uh, so that's why we run into default with uh, that amount. And it's very apparent that the fear for the default, uh, the government at this time <laughs> announced that the 5,000 rupees is going to be underwritten by the Deposit Insurance Guarantee Corporation. So that's been built in already into that. Uh, so I would say that you know we really need to uh, redefine uh, the channels that we use, and like what we were saying, uh, the the awareness that we need to build in defining utility of these goods and services that we come up with, especially for the poor. I think there's a misconception that this five thousand is free and it's given to everybody. It is conditional on on the performance of the account, on the use of on returning. So training in terms of using an overdraft, what it means. It's an overdraft, it's not 5,000 is given to you. And, yeah. So one last question, I think we are almost Oh, too many options. Okay. Hi, this is Sunny Jam from Legion Payments. My question is to you, Naveen. You talked about there are a lot of efforts being made uh, in converting cash transactions into digital, right? Well, we conducted a survey recently and where we found out there's a large number of people, uh, both buyers and sellers, they don't want to move from cash to digital as they fear they won't be able to hide their true income and spending. So how are we going to handle that, this problem? We know the infrastructure is there, but the willingness is not. Uh, well, you made a one pertinent point, but uh I think when I said 97% cash users, I meant people who are officially doing transactions and paying taxes, and which is already officially recorded with all the, all the people say taxpayer. So I didn't talk about, we are not trying to solve the problem which government is trying to solve this black money. I'm not sure whether Subir can comment on it, but I don't think we still know how much is a real black money, black economy, uh, black economy or money. Uh, because if you have a definition, then you can have a solution. So what we have defined is there is an organized transactions between consumers and businesses or consumer to consumer which are already recorded somewhere they are being done in physical cash and they are more than trillion dollar already now if you see the unorganized retail which is already recorded itself is more than a trillion dollar worth of physical cash transaction so we here all the ecosystem is looking at that physical official cash transaction which are already recorded expert identified and accounted for anyone want to add anything? So I think in the interest of time, probably I'll have to wind up because we have 30 we have another panel. What I can uh, request is that, uh, and I would first thank uh, Subir and Lavis, Matthew and Nisimha to take time off and attend this session. Thank you very much.